Good morning, and what a pleasure to get this uh, Eclipse 2017 uh, show started. It was an epic event by all measures. You know, while total solar eclipses happen about every 18 months somewhere on Earth, this eclipse in particular offered the scientists a really unique opportunity as it fell upon a first world nation with a sophisticated infrastructure and a population excited by the notion of citizen science. And what I want to do is I want to start off with this dramatic footage that was captured by citizen scientists from a drone as part of a 360 virtual reality eclipse experience. Stay tuned. This show will come to a theater near you in the new year. And this is showing the moon's shadows sweeping across the Grand Teton uh, mountain range. And, and there's something really primal about this experience, the ones that have experienced it. Over a period of less than actually an hour, it gets dark, the light gets very eerie, the color changes. Sometimes you're able to see the 360 sunset across the horizon. And then abruptly it gets 10,000 times darker in the very last minute. It, it, it is kind of awe-inspiring, and of course, then you have that glorious spectacle of seeing the inner corona. This sudden blocking of the sun during an eclipse has a huge effect because it reduces the light and changes the temperature on the ground and air, and it makes the ionosphere less ionized. These quick changing conditions can have uh, you know, uh, effect on local weather, animal behavior, ionospheric variability, and host of other effects. NASA's solar eclipse coverage was the agency's most watched and most followed event on social media to date. So that, that, that's pretty huge. And this was, I believe, over a few billion. And this is kind of what NASA did during the eclipse. NASA supported 11 science um, you know, its investigations, uh, many, many citizen science investigations, and you will hear from a few of them in this uh, panel and other sessions sprinkled at AGU throughout the week. Um, so from a NASA perspective, I think there is no other single event that has informed so many scientific disciplines and diverse that are now subject of so much of its work. Solar dynamics, heliophysics, earth science, astrobiology, planetary science, and many more. The eclipse provided unprecedented opportunity for cross-disciplinary studies. That was the hallmark, actually, of the sun, moon, earth, and their interactions. NASA supported research using balloons, um, ground measurements, planes that chase the eclipse, all of which help scientists take continuous measurements of the corona and the eclipse's effect on Earth for up to 90 minutes, because that's how long it took for the moon's shadow to sweep over. About a dozen of NASA, NOAA, ESA, JAXA spacecraft observed the sun moon alignment during the eclipse. And what you are seeing here are, of course, up close as the movie replays itself, that in the inner part, we have operating missions that are looking up close into the uh, inner uh, solar corona, those set of um, satellites. Uh, we have uh, satellites at L1 vantage point, the Lagrange point, we, from where between sun and earth, from where we look both at the sun and at Earth, and we have dramatic footage of the shadow captured from there. These uh, observatories also measure the ambient environment, not only just remote sensing environment. Scientists studied the ionosphere, a remote region of the atmosphere containing particles that are charged by solar radiation, and it is very interesting to study the disturbances that are caused when there is a sudden drop in radiation. And this sudden drop is very different from the day-night cycle, and you'll hear more about it. 
using um, array of ground-based instruments and weather balloons. A team from University of Missouri, Columbia sort of meticulously map the responses of the land and lower atmosphere of the total solar eclipse. Again, measuring temperature, humidity, winds, and carbon dioxide exchange throughout the Columbia, Missouri area, just looking for new insights uh, into Earth's response to this uh, unique celestial event. As the partial eclipse becomes total, the solar radiation in a given place actually can decrease more than three times faster than during a normal sunset. And these are the conditions that allow us to do sort of unique experiments, calibration of our models, for example. It, it's taught, uh, uh, taught us a lot. And so what I would like to do is take you to the final picture. This is a picture from Eclipse 2017 taken by one of our PIs, Shadia Habal, and her a fairly extensive group, part of whom are international. And you can see how exquisite this structure is. And this is what the eclipse makes possible, right? A view of the innermost corona that is only visible from our planet. And in a way, it cements the bond between the sun and Earth, and I would say the sun and us after this eclipse. Observing conditions during total solar eclipse offer actually unique opportunities for exploring the uh, physics of the inner solar, solar corona, which is currently not possible from any observatory, whether space or ground base. And so scientists use different approaches and tools with high spatial and temporal uh, coverage, all founded on the simple principles of the colors of light. At the heart of the studies is why is the sun's outermost corona so much hotter than the surface, and what propels the solar wind that essentially affects the entire solar system. The corona burns at more than one million degrees Celsius, pardon my pun, while its surface is only kind of a cozy 6,000 degrees Celsius. So scientific instruments from ground during this eclipse, you know, and airplanes observe coronal structures, measure material escaping from the sun at speeds of 1,000 miles per second, and capture plasma instabilities and magnetism very close to the inner boundary of the corona, which is otherwise not possible. This is sort of the missing link, the region where space weather is formed, where the corona gets heated, where the solar wind gets accelerated, and a region that is not accessible to satellite observations. It is these inner conditions that set the boundary conditions of all plasma flow in the form of solar wind throughout the solar system. This eclipse actually allowed development of new telescopes that measure the electron density, velocity, temperature, different spectral region, magnetic field, and even wave motion in the corona to answer some of these very important science questions. And we have a whole panel who will be taking you through the different parts of this eclipse path, eclipse shadow, to give you what we have learned. Thank you. Amir? Thank you, Lika. So I'm Amir Kaspi. I'm with the Southwest Research Institute in Boulder. Uh, and we uh, flew an airborne mission to observe the eclipse. Now, when most people look at the sun, they think of this, uh, sort of a featureless bright yellow ball. Uh, maybe there's some sunspots on it, but uh, you don't see the corona on a normal day. Uh, and that's one of the things that makes an eclipse so special. Now, even though this looks like a featureless ball, uh, there are magnetic fields coming out of the sun. You don't see them here, but if you look up into the, whoops, if you look up into the corona, uh, <sighs> I'm sorry, <sighs> the movie is not, ah, oh, there we go. If you look up into the corona, uh, you can see uh, structure 
in the solar corona, the outer atmosphere of the sun. Uh, what we're looking at here are images from NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory, and each one of the different colors represents a different wavelength of ultraviolet light. And each wavelength is sensitive to a different temperature and a different region of the solar corona. So as you're looking higher and hotter in the corona, you can see all of these structures, these loops and arcades and fan structures that permeate the corona. One of the questions that we don't understand, as Lika mentioned, is why the corona is so hot. It is millions of degrees compared to the underlying surface that's only a few thousand degrees. And how the energy gets into the corona to get that temperature that high is still not well understood. We also don't understand why the corona is so well structured. It looks very organized, very combed, and it should to our understanding, be a tangled mess. We don't see that, and so the corona is constantly keeping itself self-organized, and we'd like to understand why. One of the current leading theories for both of these is that there's wave motion, ripples emanating into the corona that are constantly heating the corona and releasing that twist. And that's one of the things that we wanted to look for. Now, spacecraft can observe the corona from space, but there are things that spacecraft just can't measure. They're limited by telemetry. There's a certain limit to how many images they can send down every second. And that means that they can only look for motions of particular speeds. On the other hand, we have a wonderful platform here, NASA's WB-57. Uh, it's a research aircraft that's uh, based on an airframe from the 1950s and 60s that NASA has repurposed for scientific exploration. And we were able to use these to observe the eclipse. There's an instrument on board, uh, the, um, the aircraft called the Dynamite System. It's uh, there in the nose cone, you can see it, developed by our partners at Southern Research originally to chase space shuttle launches. This served as a perfect platform to image the eclipse. Uh, there are two telescopes in the nose cone, and this is a stabilized pointed platform, so we're able to point to the sun while the aircraft is flying down the center line of the eclipse as the shadow overtakes it, and it allows us not only to extend the observing time of each airplane from two and a half minutes to about four minutes per airplane. But by flying two airplanes as we did in formation, the shadow can sweep over them in series and allow us to extend our observing time to almost eight minutes of totality. And that's exactly what we did. You can see the flight path here where the aircraft uh, flew down the center line of the path and we observed totality as well as some other observations in the meantime. There are two telescopes in this nose cone. One is observing in visible light, the kind of light that we see with our eyes. The other kind observes in infrared, basically heat emission. Uh, these are the results, first results uh, from the visible light. It looks green because we had a green filter in front in order to improve the contrast of what we're trying to look at. There are certain coronal emissions, they happen to be green, and so this filter helps cut out a lot of the scattered light background and focus on the structure that's in the corona. Now you can see on the left the raw data, the sun is shaking around, it looks a little bit blurry. Uh, even though this is a wonderfully stabilized platform, there's obviously a limit to what you can do when you're flying an aircraft at 50,000 feet and 460 miles an hour. Uh, and so we had to process the data in order to remove that jitter, to co-align all the images that allows us to stack them on top of each other, to pull out dim features that you can't see in the raw data. Uh, and on the right you can see the calibrated data that one of our team members has uh, produced and you can immediately see more structure and striations than you can see in the raw data and by doing this throughout the course of the eight minute long movie we'll be able to then do additional processing to pull out dim features and motions what we're looking for are ripples and waves you can't see them easily with your eye here but once we finish our processing we'll be able to pull out those dim features and see wave motion propagating into the corona we also took infrared imaging. This is one of the first images of the solar corona in these wavelengths. This is uh, what we call near infrared, three to five microns. Uh, this is 
a thermal imaging camera that normally you use to uh, look at uh, the heat signatures coming off of anything, chairs, people, rocket plumes. Uh, in this case, we're looking at the sun, and we actually see a lot of interesting things. We haven't even begun to analyze the infrared data. It's going to hold a lot of interesting clues. Uh, and then once we get around to analyzing this, we will be collaborating with a partner flight sponsored by the National Science Foundation that was taking spectra in this region, and we'll be able to put together our images in their spectra and learn a whole lot about why the sun is so structured and what makes the corona so hot. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Amir. Uh, I'm Matt Penn from the National Solar Observatory in Tucson, Arizona. And on the day of the eclipse, the Citizen Kate experiment had an enormous success. We got data from 61 of our 68 sites scattered across the country. And if we look at clouds, what, what fraction of our data was bothered by clouds, it looks like we observed the corona for 83 minutes out of the 93 minutes that was possible. Um, this was just due to the dedication and hard work of all of our uh, volunteers. So to back up, this, the Kate experiment is called the Continental America Telescopic Eclipse Experiment. And instead of chasing the shadow of the moon, we set up a string of 68 identical telescopes from Oregon to South Carolina and let the shadow of the moon cross uh, above our equipment. So at all times, at least one Kate telescope was in the shadow looking at the corona. And at some times, we had up to five telescopes looking at the corona simultaneously. Um, this resulted in a lot of data. We have 45,000 images. And to go along with that, we have 50,000 calibration images. So we're still working on the data processing, but I'll show you a little bit about where we're at and what we've learned so far. Um, here on the left, you uh, can see an image um, that's in white light, similar to what uh, Amir's telescope looked at. But here we've processed the data by combining eight subframes that we take with the Kate instruments and making one HDR image. This is similar to the HDR image that your cell phone makes during strange lighting conditions. The corona is about a thousand times brighter at the limb of the sun than it is at the edge of our field of view, and we've taken out that large intensity gradient with something called a radial filter. So the image on the left is not quite what you would see with your eye, but it's pretty close, and it brings up some of the detail that the uh, corona shows uh, given by the magnetic structures. Now on the right, we've enhanced that even further. We've used an edge enhancement technique called Sobel filtering, and this initially was just done to allow us to align our images with 68 different equipment setups, we have uh, angular uh, misalignment and also an X and Y offset between all of our telescopes. Um, but the uh, excuse me, features in the Sobel image uh, show some interesting dynamics. I have a movie, I haven't been able to show it uh, to you today, but I have it on my laptop after the press panel. If you'd like to take a look, uh, I can show it there. But here in the southwest, I'm sorry, southeast limb, we see a steady outflow of material it's leaving the sun at about 10 kilometers per second, which is rather slow, it's 20,000 miles per hour. But then in the north and the south poles of the sun, along these features that we call polar plumes, we see much more rapid evolution and faster outflows, things leaving the sun at 100 kilometers per second or 200,000 miles per hour. And then if we look finally at the really high resolution data, this surprised us, but down here near the limb of the sun, we can see interactions between the cold atmosphere of the sun called the chromosphere which is only 10,000 degrees, and the hot corona, which is at a million degrees, as, as my colleagues have said. Uh, we're hoping to, uh, again, analyze this data in more detail and come out with some publications in the near uh, future. 75% of our funding was uh, donated by uh, private and corporate sources, and because of this, we were able to give the telescopes to all of our volunteers, and so they're working with them now on different projects after the eclipse. As I said, we had 68 sites and we have 68 really fascinating stories to tell. Um, but one per person in particular uh, really uh, sort of uh, embodies the, the Kate uh, group, the, the spirit of the Kate team. This is Dr. Fred Ispener. Uh, Fred was our first volunteer in 2015. So he was on a vacation to the Faroe Islands to see the solar eclipse and we sent him a prototype telescope. But on the morning of the eclipse, it was raining. Fortunately, Fred is a stubborn and dedicated person. And so he set up the telescope in the rain and covered it with a garbage bag from his hotel room so that when it cleared up during totality, he was able to capture 30 seconds of data. And that's the image up here. So this is our first Kate prototype image. And, and Fred provided the proof of concept that we could take a citizen scientist 
send them, in this case, halfway around the world, and he could come back with real data of the solar corona. This enabled us to get funding to develop a team of students who went to Indonesia in 2016, and Fred also tagged along. He led a team on a cruise ship, again on his vacation, and took data from uh, Indonesia. And then finally, in 2017, Fred took data from our site number 42 in Carbondale, Illinois, with Jasmine Taylor and, and Howard Harper, and his frame is part of our movie sequence. So again, uh, the Kate experiment really relied on the dedication of all of our citizen scientists, but Fred Isbrenner is one of the uh, special cases. Thank you. Hello, I'm Greg Earle from Virginia Tech, and I'm going to bring the focus down a little closer to Earth because unlike the previous speakers, we're not going to be talking about things that go on on the sun, but things that happen much closer to home. So to introduce this, I have to talk about the ionosphere, which is sort of the barrier region between the atmosphere that we're familiar with and what we would think of as outer space to some extent, it's shown by the bubbles here. Um, the ionosphere is affected, obviously, by radiation from the sun, or I wouldn't be here. It's also affected by weather systems from below. So these bubbles are supposed to show the ionosphere. Radio waves propagate through it, but they're affected by it. And that's the crux of our experiment. It's also the altitude range where the aurora happens at high latitudes and where the space station and low Earth orbit satellites fly. So the ionosphere is a, an interesting region. It's kind of this boundary, and it's the focus of our research. So the, the plot in the bottom here, uh, with the world shown as a, a section of a globe, um, really illustrates what the ionosphere does to radio waves. So essentially, if you send a radio wave up at the right frequency and at the right angle, you can basically, as it propagates through the ionosphere, it will curve. It will, it will be bent. And so the yellow line here shows such a ray that is basically going up, getting slightly perturbed, and then propagating off into space. Uh, never to return. The white curve, by contrast, shows a similar wave, similar frequency, similar angle, but this one meets the conditions for a total refraction, a bending that actually makes the wave come back and come back and hit the Earth. So this is the radio communication mode that's used by ham radio operators. It's also how Marconi did his first transatlantic propagation experiment way back in 1901. So this technology is still in use and we tried to exploit this to, to study the eclipse. So the figure in the upper left there shows um, kind of the, the orange stripe of roughly where the eclipse crossed the United States. We're very fortunate because there are two permanent radar systems, one in Oregon and one in Kansas called the Super Darn systems um, that are shown by those fan-shaped regions uh, in the upper left of the plot. And those were, happened to be just, just through dumb luck uh, the eclipse passed right across the field of view of, of those radars. So that was just fortuitous, but we took advantage of it, obviously. Um, in addition to that, we built four other sites, three of which are shown here. Um, HF propagation or, or radars, temporary radars, that we put up at three stations across the country so we could intercompare the measurements and, and see what the eclipse did at, did at these three different sites. So the idea here is when an eclipse happens, it essentially creates a hole in the ionosphere. And that hole affects these radio waves differently than they would be affected during normal conditions. So we wanted to use that to study the eclipse and also to validate and verify how our models worked. So my last slide here shows that the simulation we did prior to the eclipse is in the upper left. And so what you see there is that orange band going across the arc. That's the ionosphere, or the densest part of the ionosphere. So on a normal day, it looks like that top figure. And the black lines that you see superimposed on that show the paths of radio propagation at a particular frequency. In this case, I think it's 14 megahertz. Um, the bottom slide, the, the similar one, but with the, the sort of hole in the ionosphere where you see that yellow band broken, that shows what happens in the eclipse. That hole in the ionosphere is produced by the eclipse, and it affects how these radio propagation, uh, how these radio waves propagate. So as you can see, instead of just going up and being refracted and coming back down, they get what we call ducted. They get um, 
able to communicate over much, much longer distances. So the, the propagation paths of these waves, even if they're launched at the same frequency and the same angle, will go much farther during um, an eclipse condition than they would in a non-eclipse condition. So that was our prediction beforehand, the simulation. And what we saw in the actual data very nicely confirmed that. This is data from one of the SuperDarn radars, and what you see here is signal range on the, on the vertical axis. So that's basically telling you how far that radar ray penetrates or how far it goes. And time of day is on the, the horizontal axis. And so this cusp-like feature that you see um, occurring midway through the figure is actually the eclipse. So what we're seeing is these radio waves that we're sending out from the SuperDarn radar basically following a northern pattern, a normal pattern, and then getting greatly elongated during the eclipse, and then recovering back to normal afterwards. So this is a real vindication that our ray tracing model and that um, the SuperDarn radar were both working well and gave us very similar results. I'm Angela Desjardins. I'm the principal investigator of the Eclipse Ballooning Project. And we all have a short amount of time. We're like overpowering the, the stage up here. And I'm not going to just tell you about one thing or two things. I'm actually going to tell you about three different things, but I'm going to get through it, I promise. <laughs> First, I'm going to cover the Eclipse Ballooning Project in general, the, the main project. Second, I'll talk briefly about a space biology experiment we did. And finally, I'll talk about the atmospheric science experiment that we did. On Eclipse Day, nearly 1,000 students on 55 college and high school teams gathered along the path of totality to fly scientific balloons 100,000 feet into the air. These student teams were the first to share live video of a total solar eclipse from this perspective. They were also the first to fly a constellation of scientific balloons across a continent. This is what the video payload looks like that sent the live video down from the balloons. So here we have the little camera, it's just a simple little camera, and everything was powered by a small computer uh, which is called a Raspberry Pi, was the basis of everything. Behind here we actually have um, a more complicated control board that was put together by students and faculty at Montana State University. Normally the batteries would go here, and then on the back side we actually have the radio that sent the live video down to the antennas on the ground. So that's um, as simple as it is, but it's actually um, hugely complicated. So yeah, the project was, was challenging in many ways. Um, actually, when we started thinking about this project, live streaming didn't even exist. Um, but that's actually, that challenging part is actually what made the project exciting, um, worthwhile, and, and innovative. So next, I'm going to just talk briefly about the space biology experiment. So dozens of those eclipse ballooning teams also flew harmless bacteria attached to their payloads as part of a NASA experiment aimed at understanding how Earth life might survive on Mars. Obviously, it's important to make sure we don't contaminate other planets with life from Earth. NASA works very hard to prevent this from happening, but due to their abundant nature, some tiny organisms might hitch a ride. Therefore, we need to understand if microscopic life, such as bacteria, could survive on Mars. It turns out that the layer of the atmosphere where the balloons fly, called the stratosphere, is similar in many ways to the surface of Mars. One aspect of the stratosphere that's not normally similar is the amount of sunlight. During the total solar eclipse, however, this actually does come into, into similarity, providing a, a great time to do this study. Scientists from NASA Ames and Cornell are busy analyzing the data and will have results soon. Oh. 
really? OK. <laughs> Finally, last, to, I'd like to spend a couple minutes talking about the atmospheric science experiment. So the lowest layer of our atmosphere experience, experiences changes between night and day. We wondered, does the darkness of a total solar eclipse create similar changes? We found that, indeed, it does. The planetary boundary layer is defined by the area where surface features interact with the atmosphere, creating significant temperature changes. As temperature increases during the day, the height of the planetary boundary layer also increases. This normal day and night change is shown in blue on the graph. In order to examine the planetary boundary layer and other atmospheric effects of the eclipse, we had 12 Radioson launch sites across the country. Radiosons, which look like this, are instruments that the National Weather Service flies every day to gather weather data. The data shown here in pink is from one of those eclipse day launch sites. As you can see, the measured height of the boundary layer was high before the partial phase of the eclipse began. Then, as the amount of sunlight reduced, decreasing the temperature, the layer also quickly reduced. This change in the boundary layer was anticipated, but has never been measured in this level of detail before. Analysis of the atmospheric data from all the sites will conclude in the coming months. The eclipse, as a unique incident, will teach us a lot about the atmosphere in general. In conclusion, through awe-inspiring footage, an interesting space biology experiment, and the rich atmospheric data, the Eclipse Ballooning Project was a resounding success. For me, it was even more powerful because students were involved in every aspect of the project. One of our students will be available tomorrow in the Expo Hall during the Eclipse Ballooning Project meet and greet at 2 p.m. So if you're interested in talking to one of our students, you can join us then. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jay Herman. Uh, I used to work at, as a civil servant at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. I retired a number of years ago. Now I work full time for the University of Maryland. And uh, is there a, a slide? Uh, you can use the arrow, arrow key. Other one. Got one. Okay. I'm going to tell you a bit of a story instead of talking about all this science stuff. Uh, back in 1998, uh, I was the project scientist on a very interesting spacecraft that was called Triana. And Triana, at the time, was uh, basically looked at as, why would you want to do that? You're going to take pictures of the Earth, it'll be a screensaver, you watch grass grow, and we all know how exciting it is to watch grass grow. So uh, the former vice president at the time was the one who supposedly proposed this. Anyway, it was supposed to launch in 2001. And uh, it was pushed off the space shuttle that it was supposed to be on and put into storage, which turned out to be a fortunate thing because many years later, uh, we got the opportunity to refurbish this spacecraft and actually make it into a fine scientific instrument. It did a number of things aside from just observing the eclipse. The image you're, you're seeing there has the dark spot of the eclipse, but there's many other exciting things if I'd made a movie that you would see. One of the most interesting things is looking at the cloud structure. What you're actually looking at is the Earth from sunrise to sunset. On your left is sunrise, on your right is sunset. And one of the things to notice are the cloud structures. There was a lot of speculation that, for example, clouds amounts would change based on the amount of sunlight. And it is true, that does happen. So for example, at San Diego, you get morning fog, which then clears as the, sun, as the sun comes up. But in general, over the whole globe, the, sun's, the cloud amounts stay constant. And the clouds are sort of like rivers of clouds in the sky, rather than these ephemeral things that we normally think of when we look at it from the ground. What's going on is the clouds rotate with the Earth. And from the vantage point of, of uh, Discover, which is the new name for, for Triana, the clouds are sort of stationary over a day or so. Uh, if you want to visualize this, think of the sun behind your head, and you're looking straight at the Earth. And this is what you're seeing here. 
And this is a so-called color realistic image that we've produced by taking several of the wavelength channels and producing a color image. Now, one of the exciting things we saw, it's not like grass growing, was this eclipse. And we saw the eclipse from when it occurred over the Pacific Ocean all the way across the United States and out into the Atlantic Ocean. So for a period of about three hours, we have multiple uh, eclipse images. This particular one is Casper, Wyoming. And the little star, I'm standing right under that at Casper. You can't see me because of the star. <laughs> <laughs> I'm bashful. Anyway, uh, so you can see the dark circle of the eclipse. Now, one of the reasons we were doing this is not just, to, not just to observe the eclipse. That was fun, I have to admit. But the real reason we were doing this is because we're trying to study the effect of radiation in the, the sun's radiation in the atmosphere. What's of real interest is how do clouds affect the sun's radiation and the Earth's energy balance, which has a lot to do with global warming, climate change, and things like that. So one of the ways we do this is by creating scientific models of the atmosphere to study the radiation as it penetrates through the Earth. The eclipse ordered, offered an opportunity for a very simple cloud, that's the moon, way above the atmosphere, creates a shadow on the Earth, and the question is, can the scientific models do this simple problem and get it right before you take those same scientific models and study the clouds and try to answer the detailed questions? And that was the reason that we went to Casper, Wyoming, and Columbia, Missouri to set up both ground-based instruments and then use, this, use the uh, Discover Epic images of the, of the eclipse as it passed as it crossed the Earth. Uh, on the next slide. Oh, yeah, that's right. right there. Okay, this is a, on, the, on your left, is, a, uh, is an image of what, the, what Epic actually saw. Now, what you're looking at, there's a CCD on Epic that has 4 million pixels, 2048 by 2048 in a square. And this is the illumination of the center of the, of the CCD showing you uh, the amount of light that was occurring. Now, I've rotated the image so that north is down, that you can actually see into the blue hole that was the eclipse. Now, inside that eclipse, we actually did some quantitative measurements and showed that the amount of light got reduced by uh, about 1,000 to 1 from, from when it's illuminated. And uh, or actually more than that, but th there were clouds in the area, so you get some illumination coming in from scattering from the clouds. And it, it's really pretty interesting. So I've done uh, analysis of this and uh, publishing a paper on it. On the, on the right, you can see the same image. I've rotated the... The, uh, the image you saw in the first one, so that north is down and, uh, and east is to your left and west is to your right and south is up. Uh, but basically the, the idea is can we take this data that you're seeing there and take a, a, a very sophisticated scientific model and reproduce this accurately? If we can, then we'll apply this to clouds and see how high clouds reflect radiation to space and then put, create shadows on the Earth and affect the amount of energy both reaching the Earth and reflected back to space, which contributes to the energy balance of the Earth. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much. We will now open it up uh, to questions from reporters in the room. Please raise your hand and state your name and affiliation. Uh, Seth Bornstein, AP. Actually, um, if you want to just stay up there, Jay, uh, because I, uh, I was waiting for the answer. Is, is does the model did the model get it right? We don't know yet. Yeah. This is a, this is a, an, an enormous project. Now, obviously, we did this in August 21st, 2017, and we have we just got done analyzing the spacecraft measurements. I expect the model work to take a year or two. This is not something that's trivially done. Because in order to do the model work, we also have to take the spacecraft measurement of clouds, aerosols, and the ground reflectivity, put this all together in a three-dimensional model, and figure out how to make these calculations. There was another calculation done on a 2006 eclipse uh, that occurred over the Mediterranean, and the answers they got from that eclipse disagree with these measurements. So we're in the second stage of this. Now we have actual real data and we'll go see if we can do the same kind of modeling, but more accurately. And my follow-up question is, is maybe for Matt or someone else here, 
is honestly, as I come out of this, you know, it's been four months now, and I'm waiting for, this is the science we have learned. And I'm not sure any of you have actually said, here's what we now know that we did not know before. Is there anything any of you could tell me that says, here is what we now know already that we didn't know before? And why is that, is that important? Well, yeah, so in the, um, in the polar areas of the Cape experiment, we do see outflows. And I apologize, I can show you the movie on, on my laptop. We see outflows moving at 100 kilometers per second uh, from the surface of the sun. So that's new. And we hope to add to that. But I think, I think one thing that you're picking up on is that the Cape data is brand new. And we're really excited about taking this new type of data that no one has ever taken before. And now we're at the phase where we've got this new type of data and we realize no one's ever tried to analyze data like this before. So we're inventing the analysis techniques as well. And it's going to take time. I, I think I'll take another crack at it also. I mean, this was an opportunity where we have combined so many different new techniques and ways of observing the corona that we haven't done before. You have seen just uh, the sample of infrared image. There were other infrared instruments on ground. Infrared is very sensitive to magnetic field. What is it we don't know in the corona? We don't have any real measurement of the magnetic field in the corona. And we are very hopeful that observations like this are going to allow us to tell what are possible, for example, for ground-based measurements, say, of infrared, or can we envision a space-based infrared uh, measurement that gives us the clue. I mean, at the end of the day, it's the magnetic field that kind of shapes the corona, that is at the very heart of everything that goes on in the solar wind. I think that would be a very big step, but you know, people have just collected the data and we don't have all the precise answer yet. I'm hopeful that with NASA's help, we will be able to kind of support the scientific investigation of the many different kinds of data that have been collected. So this, this is just give you a small example. There is a session, science session, the next couple of days where we are really going to delve into the details of some of the signs that people have unearthed. Uh, Sarah? Another? I'll tell you one thing that we didn't know before. We had, we had measurements of the whole Earth, so we saw the, all the radiation coming from the Earth. It's a small fact, but we found out the eclipse reduces the total radiation by 9.6%. This is something that was not known before. It's not a earth-shaking number, but it is brand new. Uh, Sarah? Oh, yeah, I have a question for Jay also. Um, uh, Sarah Kaplan from I'm the sorry. Washington Post. I just Going back to that, that image you showed us, the last slide, that's radiation being reflected off clouds from the Earth, or? It's from the clouds, okay. aeros aerosols on the ground. The, the majority of, of the radiation is reflected from clouds. So the, on, the, on your left, those red, that's the equatorial cloud banks, the white clouds that you see there. And the, uh, the yellows are from the lower altitude clouds. That, that's so the majority of the radiation is reflected from the clouds. They have reflectivities of anywhere between 40 to 80 percent whereas the ground is, is a few percent, 6%, 5%, depending on what wavelength you're looking at, or vegetation, you might get up to 8 or 10%. And the idea, just I'm trying to like connect the dots between everything you talked about. The idea is that the studying this, that hole that you mentioned that's created by the moon's shadow, that's light that is never even reaching. The, be, because, it, because that's a shadow, you, you're not seeing any reflection from there. So what does that tell you about the amount of, about how Earth reflects radiation from the sun. If I had changed, if on, on the image on your right, if I had changed what's called the gamma function, those of you who are interested in Photoshop, uh, the eclipse would have occur, appeared as, as, a, as a round dot, small round dot in the center, surrounded by the penumbra, in other words, the partial eclipse region. Uh, if you study the distribution of radiation, uh, this, this is a really difficult problem for a model to be able to reproduce given the clouds. So what you're seeing is the influence in the, on the left side, you're seeing the influence of the clouds and the penumbra, and in the very center, if you, if you could see the color, it gets a little darker blue, is the umbra, namely the to totality. 
and I probably should have put the gamma adjusted uh, image on, the, on, the, on your right, because then, then you would actually see the, the region of totality as a small circle inside of that larger shadow. And, the, and just to clarify, so whether or not the model is able to, um, to match what you guys observed, what does that, uh, like, well, we have I guess what is it going to test about the model? Okay, we have satellites up. One of them is called Ceres, C-E-R-E-S, uh, that, that attempts to measure the amount of radiation coming back. And one of the problems with satellites is you only get a piece of the information, what's coming out of the top of the atmosphere. The trick is to understand the mechanisms that are producing what you're seeing. And the only way to do this is with a combination of measurements in different places, say the ground and satellites, and then the models to figure out what's going on in between. And until you understand the mechanisms and can explain it carefully so that I could explain it uh, to, well, I was gonna say to my mother, but she's long gone. Uh, explain, if I could explain it to my mother, then I, then I would say I understand it. Uh, and that's what the models are about, to, to actually know the details of what's going on instead of, I, instead of me telling you, oh, look, it's changed by 10%. The next question you should ask me is why? And I should be able to answer you. And if I can't do that, I haven't solved the problem. And that's what's going on with these measurements and the models. We have a question on the chat. Hello? Yes. Uh, we have a question uh, from Rick Lovett uh, relating to the ionosphere experiment. Uh, he asks, what do we learn from validating this model? Well, validation of models is very important for ionospheric physics, and so we look for every opportunity we can to try and um, compare our model predictions to what we actually observe. But one of the things that, uh, this, this touches a little on uh, Seth's question, I think, um, one of the things we learned in the ionosphere experiment that was essentially not well predicted by the models is that, uh, I have to step back a minute here, the Earth is a magnet. So there are, we visualize that with drawing fictitious but visualization purposes, magnetic field lines. And one of the things we found in the ionosphere, in, in the experiment we did, was that even though the, the sun is shining or, and the moon is, is creating this shadow in the northern hemisphere in the US, if you take those field lines, those magnetic field lines that were in the eclipse region and you map them down to the other hemisphere, they come down in South America somewhere. And we saw eclipse effects there as well. So even in the non-eclipse region that was magnetically connected to the eclipse region, we were able to see ionospheric effects. And that was really kind of a surprise. So the models that I was aware of didn't predict that in advance and certainly not to the extent that we observed. Okay, hi, this is Rick Feinberg from the American Astronomical Society. My question is for Angela. Um, it's sort of multi-part. Uh, were the payloads under the balloons, were they stabilized? And whatever the answer to that one, uh, are you gonna be able to create some sort of movie that shows from the stratospheric altitude what the shadow looked like as it moved across the country? And then um, finally, what, if anything, was the scientific uh, rationale for, for taking the images, or was that just a, a, a vehicle toward getting some of this other data that you described? So the majority of the teams did not have pointing, um, so we have restrictions from the FAA on how much we can lift, how heavy the payloads can be, and so a mechanical device was really too heavy. Um, we did have a few teams that flew a modified one that was digitally pointing, so it had lots of cameras um, that could point in the direction we wanted to point. But from up at that altitude, you can actually see the eclipse coming and going for about 10 minutes on either side. And just the natural motions that happened of the movement of the payloads. Um, everybody who flew their balloons and got footage um, during totality, they saw that in their camera at some point. Um, as for putting um, a whole movie together, um, so our footage is a little bit zoomed in, I guess, to be able to make a very, you know, movie that would be easy to watch. We do have movies available um, online and it's been posted on social media and we have lots of um, footage, thousands of images and videos on our website that are available. And so we have like a nice 33 minute video that shows almost everyone's um, footage as it, as it went across. But it's not like a, oh, I can see it going across real easily. It's, it's bits and pieces a little bit um, more zoomed in. But there are really fantastic features that you can see there. Um, Yellowstone Lake and Yellowstone National Park, Mount Hood, um, et cetera. Okay. 
Hi, um, uh, my name is David Brown, a uh, freelance. Um, my question concerns uh, Kate uh, the, and the ballooning project and really in, in any large team, multi-year project. Um, what were some of the lessons learned going into or, or coming out of the 2017 eclipse that you'll be able to apply to, say, 2024? Matt, do you want to go? Oh, I guess I'm at the microphone. I could go first. So for me, there was lots of lessons that were learned um, about doing huge collaborations, and I think this is probably true with Matt and just the, the kind of training that we did. But for me, the biggest lesson is you have to have something that's really exciting and challenging in order to get the students involved and in order for the general public to be involved. And so, you know, Matt had a, a very big science goal. Mine was more like involve the, the general public. And so for me, it's like using cutting edge technology, um, having something that's challenging and therefore citizens and students want to get, get involved with. Yeah, I, would, um, I would agree with uh, Angela's uh, uh, statement. I think that most of our volunteers were going to see the eclipse anyway. And so what we did is to try to enable them to elevate their experience by participating in research. And so that goes from collecting the data to publication. And we're not quite there yet, but many of them, of course, are looking forward to that. I think the lesson that I learned for 2024 is that we could have had 200 sites easily with the amount of interest that we had. So if the funding agencies could uh, help us out a little bit more, <laughs> or private and corporate donations, I think we could have a, a much bigger event in 2024. Go ahead. Uh, hey, um, my name is Brian Resnick, and I uh, write for Vox. Uh, Greg, you were mentioning with um, the Onosir experiments that the radar was able to penetrate further. I'm just kind of curious, was there like some interesting effect like if you had a local radio station during the eclipse you could broadcast further than usual and there's is there a way to think about how much more you know range you have like i don't know the next eclipse if i want to set up something like yeah that. absolutely um essentially when you get this lengthening of the ray paths when the radars are able to see much further it does affect systems but not Nothing like your cell phone, not a system that most people in the street are familiar with. Um, but there's an over-the-horizon radar network. Uh, there are several of these around the world that were first developed for military purposes. And the idea was really to spot cruise missiles. You know, you want to spot something coming at you before it clears the horizon because then you've got more time to react to it. Well, it turns out that those over-the-horizon radar frequencies are exactly the same frequencies and they use exactly the same kind of antennas as the radars we're using to monitor things like the eclipse. So there are repercussions um, on technological systems that are actually still in use for a variety of, of purposes. Yeah, Rick Lovett wanted to follow up with uh, Greg. Um, what do we use this model for in practical or scientific terms? That is, does this affect our understanding of space weather? Defense against solar systems, communications, GPS, looking, he's looking for the why do we care type of information. <laughs> why do we care, right. Um, for GPS, I, I don't think the, uh, the effects or the, the magnitude of something like an eclipse is, is a large enough effect for anybody to be worried about. And as, as I told several reporters um, locally before the eclipse experiment, everyone wanted to know, you know, am I going to drive off the cliff because of the eclipse is messing up the GPS in my car? Uh, none of the effects of an eclipse are, are that severe. Um, but for people like ham radio operators and over the horizon radar, as I mentioned before, um, and AM band radio, which is again, same frequency range, um, those signals will go significantly further during an eclipse event. And so we do learn things about space weather from that. We do learn things, and this kind of ties into the models, right? So if, if you can validate your model using something like an eclipse, and which is really in geophysical terms, it's, it's sort of an impulsive event. It's relatively short-lived, right? So if you can validate your model on, on that short-lived um, ringing of the onospheric bell, so to speak, then you have high confidence that you can use it to predict other things. And so it's, it's, not, it's not a breakthrough. It's a, you know, science doesn't always have breakthroughs. Sometimes we make advances through incremental steps that take years or decades. Um, and this is one such, one such instance where we understand how our models work. We're learning some of the limitations of the models by comparing them to things like this eclipse event. And through that, we can do better predictions of space weather cause and effect, as well as uh, the impact on technological systems that are in use and AM radio. We have another question in the room. 
Hi, that's uh, James Dacey from Physics World. So it's a question for Matt about the Cape project. Uh, so do you have any sort of idea or information about the citizen scientists, you know, in terms of their science literacy? Um, and also, you know, when it comes to sort of making the discoveries and, and publishing that, have you thought how you would give any kind of meaningful credit to those people? Because it might be that you list them all on the paper, but that might not be something they, that that's not their currency really, is it? Right, so, um, well, a lot of them are interested in being co-authors and, and we'll do that. Um, I'll talk tomorrow and I'll have a slide with 260 co-authors. Um, but some of them um, obviously are just beginning. Uh, and so what we're trying to do is to get them involved in other types of astronomy as well because they have the equipment now. We're developing follow-up projects to try to get them more engaged and develop their own literacy. And for a lot of the students, of course, they, uh, we've got um, from eighth graders up through graduate school. So they're looking for different things. The undergrads and grads want to be co-authors. It's a high school science fair season now, and so we're hoping to get a calibrated data set to high school students to, to use during their science fairs across the country. Um, and so we're, uh, I guess we're doing different things at, for different levels. Thank you. Are there any other questions from reporters in the room? Okay, hold on. Seth Borenstein, AP again. I guess, Jay, um, if you talk about the 9.6 percent, or you know, just you know, to round it up to 10 percent, is that about what was expected or, 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 or predicted? Is it more? Is it less? And if it's more or if it's less, what are the implications in terms of climate change? Because I know cloud mo modeling clouds is sort of one of the hardest things to do in, in climate change models. Does this tell us that we are overestimating the radi you know, the trapped radiation, the trapped energy, or underestimating that now? Um, at okay. What I can tell you is the previous model that was run on an eclipse gave a smaller number, and that's because they used what's called a clear sky model, whereas we had real clouds in this model. So we, we actually, I'm, I'm sorry, I said that backwards. Uh, the, the, the original model estimated less uh, less change because they had a clear sky model. Uh, we had some clouds around, so we, we actually had a, a, a slightly bigger number of, for, for change. But this has really no bearing whatsoever, these, this number, on the, on the uh, climate problem or the, or the earth energy balance. When we take, if we're successful and we apply this model to clouds, then we'll have a, an answer of the type you're, you're seeking. But at the moment, I cannot give you a definitive answer on that. But I guess what I'm, trying to under, what, I'm, what I'm trying to understand is as you continue, let's say since you, you're, the model had less change. Yep. And as you continue, if you find that in reality there was more change, I'm trying to, I can just follow the steps, what would that mean? Would that mean that the models are underestimating the energy, the heat, trapped or would it mean they're overestimating? <laughs> I, I, I really cannot answer that at the moment. The cloud problem is very complex because you have the cloud tops reflecting energy, the cloud is a bulk shadowing the earth. The combination of the two right now is not really well known and I can't tell you which way this is going to work. All I know is that right now the models do not give the correct answer. And what the purpose of this was to the first step in figuring out how to improve the models so they do give the correct answer. Thank you. Are there any other questions in the room? Are there any other questions on the chat? Okay, great. That concludes our press conference. Thank you. Up next is a media availability with Dan Rather at 145.